Well, you know what that alarm sound means by now. There is more emergency good news here to talk about on the Assembly Call. Welcome, Hoosier fans, to another emergency IU basketball podcast as today. Your Indiana Hoosiers basketball program got more good offseason news as one of the assistant coach slots was filled by a guy that a lot of IU fans have been clamoring for. And two more of the players inside of the transfer portal have decided to stay in Bloomington. And we are here to break it all down. I don't think you need me to formally say what the banner moment is, right? Uh, getting Dane Fife to come on as one of the three assistant coaches, getting Jordan Geronimo and Christian Lander back, huge for the present and future of Mike Woodson's program at Indiana. Uh, I'm Jared Morris. I'm here with the coach, Brian Tonsoni. We'll see who else shows up. I was just out shoe shopping with my daughter when the Christian Lander news broke. And then you know, we're thinking about maybe going to a second spot as the Jordan Geronimo news breaks. And it's like... All right, I got to go home. We got to record. We got to talk about this because this is uh this is good big news. So, coach, let me bring you in here as uh as you're wearing your Baylor hat getting ready for tonight's game between Baylor <laughs> between Baylor and Gonzaga. Uh let's go. Your initial reaction to uh to all three of these and then we can break them all down individually. Well, it just shows um that coach Woodson's coming in here and he's got a message. Uh, and a lot of people are listening to the message, both coaches uh, and, and players that had been in the transfer portal. And, and that's exciting because I think uh, w- when you look back on what has happened in the last few years, it, it's that lack of messaging, that lack of, of being connected, that, that lack of relationship that really um, you know, derailed potential. And, and so it, it's nothing but exciting when, when you have players who committed to Indiana lose their coach, decide to come back after listening to the pitch from, from the new coach. And you have guys uh, like Dane Fife, who, who just are the epitome of what Indiana basketball is about as far as toughness and defense and biting people and all that good things. You know, it's nice to have him uh, back in, in the program. And, and it, it isn't a time of, you know, being excited. We, we still need to see the on-court results, and, and I'm always going to be a little more cautious than everybody else is that potential is a, is a, a real bad word for us coaches, right? You, you have a lot of players that have potential, and then when it comes tip-off time in November, that potential is not at reached. The coaches are going to have to work hard, uh, and uh, the players are going to have to work hard because this roster was 12 and 15, and, and you can't put it all on the coach. I think a lot of it was on the coach. Um but uh, you got to be careful of that potential. We're, we're not going to be in a you know Big Ten champion. We're not going to be in a Final Four just because the, the players are coming back. But it is a step in the right direction. It is something to be positive, uh, quite a bit positive as as opposed to what we've had in in the last few years. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, look, you know, we are eight nine days removed from a whole lot of articles coming out wondering if Indiana, if some booster paid ten million dollars for Indiana to have a worse roster next season. And look what's happened in the time since then. You know, we don't know how Mike Woodson is going to do as a coach. You know, as I've said many times, I think his history as a coach has been kind of undersold. And I think there's a lot of reasons to think that he's going to be successful. But we've never seen him as a college coach, right? What better way then to help him succeed as a college coach than to get a staff with Thad Mata, Kenya Hunter, Dane Fife, and assistant coach to be named later. And I think all of us who are hosting, all of us listening, know who we want that name to be. Uh, Mike Lewis from UCLA, and we'll have to wait and see. But even just with the staff that you have now, you know, you've really, you know, you've given Mike Woodson such a great support staff. And then to look at what Mike Woodson is doing, as you said, laying out his vision for these guys, all of whom had good options. Jordan Geronimo had good options to go play closer to home. Christian Lander is a five star point guard that would have been wanted almost anywhere, you know, and these guys are choosing to come back here. That is huge. It's really, really big. And so, so everybody who wondered if we were spending $10 million to you know, have a worse roster and yada, yada, all this stuff, you're right. We have to wait for the results. But there is literally nothing that could have happened up until now that could make you feel better about this, including you know, bringing Trace Jackson Davis back and everything else that is happening. By the way, I love Tate Frazier, uh, or Tate, Tate Frazier from Titus and Tate, his tweet, I thought Mike Woodson couldn't recruit. I don't know. <laughs> see, see, seems like he's doing okay. Yeah, but I, I, I'm always going to counter uh, the the crimson colored glasses because we got to be careful because we had slam dunk hires before, 
Uh, we had good news before. It, it, it's just got to play out. You couldn't script it any better, Jared, though, really, um, if anyone doubted. And, you know, there was a lot of talk, and I, and I think it was a legitimate, you know, question is if six guys, if they all left, Coach Woodson still could be a good coach and heading in the right direction. Uh, but the questions out there is if everyone leaves, it, what's the roster going to look like? And you, we've seen coaches come in and rosters like Nebraska happen. That was a potential – that was really a possibility uh, to happen, and to dismiss that, uh, I think, is is not good. But it didn't happen, and, right. and that's the plus. The plus is that he's selling his vision, and kids are buying it that had other options. Coaches are buying it that either want to stay or come in, and that has to be nothing but but good news. But in reading Twitter and a lot of things, and I and I know a lot of people, they can be as pleased as they want to be. Um, for five years, Indiana basketball hasn't been winning. Uh, it needs to win in November. It's not going to win a press conference. It's not going to win a Twitter war. Those things are done, right? It's about winning basketball games. And, and anything about that, you know, we can throw a party, but it doesn't mean anything. Uh, right. And so for me, it's the step in the right direction. Yep. Very positive, but it has to be followed up by actual hard work on the floor to reach that potential. Absolutely. Okay. And coming in to counter that, I'm sure. <laughs> a couple of friends who you know, always here to put the brightest spin on the latest IU basketball news. Eric Pankowski is there, and I think that's the real Ward. I don't think that's Board Ward. I think that is actual Ward who's there. Uh, guys, your reaction to Dane Fife returning to Bloomington and Jordan Geronimo and Christian Lander doing the same? I was smoking two cigars simultaneously about 20 minutes ago. I started one cigar when Dane Fife was announced, and then I was enjoying it and enjoying the Twitter and enjoying the, just the warm glow of Dane returning to his rightful home. And then the Lander news breaks, and I'm like, well, I got to light up a second cigar for him. So I had two going at the same time. <laughs> That's how I feel what's going on. Ward? I'm just happy that now there's somebody on the coaching staff as crazy as us fans. <laughs> <laughs> I love Dane so much. There's nobody we've spent more time piecing together more phone calls mm -hmm. for there to be a longer two episodes that could have been six of the show. And just the guy who's that open and that real, clearly he's connected with Coach Tom Izzo, Hall of Famer for a yep. decade plus, and all those players that have come through. But even, you know, his, his growing up in Michigan with Michigan ties, Michigan State now, obviously where he's at now, I think you take what he's been so capable and good at at another school, and now he's going to bring his IU passion, which we know is deep, yeah. very deep. I think he's going to be even better at his job in Bloomington, which is very, very exciting. Yeah, you know, you guys have obviously spent time talking with him. You've had, you know, Michael Lewis on your podcast. So I think you guys are pretty uniquely qualified to give us some insight on the coaching part of this. Um, you know, so maybe continue on, Eric, with what Ward was just talking about. What are the strengths that you think Dane is going to bring to this staff? You know, it's funny. I've been thinking a lot about that as the, the buzz has kind of picked up steam with him. And I know a lot of people are like, well, he was such a good defensive player for Indiana. He's a great defensive coach. We don't know that. Like, I don't know that. I mean, there's a lot of things that people could be good at themselves but couldn't necessarily teach that. So I don't really think of it in terms like that. Here's what I do know from spending time with him. Dane is an extremely thoughtful human being when it comes to what the players are going through. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I mean that from the pressure that they feel, the anxiety, the stress, the going from high school to transitioning to college to just becoming kind of a – I know we can't, you're not supposed to use this word, but these kids are in some ways professionals when they're at high-end Division I college. You have to take care of your business. You know, you have to treat your body right. you got to get the right sleep. You've got to pack. You've got to, like, be able to manage a bunch of different things. And Dane, who I think struggled with some of that, including the pressure as a player, and he'll be the first to tell you, he is so keenly aware of that, that I think that being in tune with that has helped him build real relationships with the players. Mm. And I think one thing that we've heard a lot of in these last couple of weeks since, since the last staff was let go was how the relationships just weren't cemented in a way that I think we all thought maybe they were. 
And I think we're hearing more and more from players that they weren't. And it's a little surprising to me, truthfully. I, I was not aware of some of that stuff. And I think Dane is really thoughtful about that stuff. And I think connecting viscerally to these kids in 2021 is more important than what foot you close out a three-pointer with uh, in many ways. And, and uh, look, coach can, can break down the X's and O's better, you know, forgets more in one day than, than I will ever know. But I do think being connected viscerally to these kids is such a huge thing. And I think we've seen Woody has shown proof of that already, that he can connect in a pretty short time. Dane has shown that over a, a career as a head coach at, at IPFW and then, and then of course, at, at Michigan State for the better part of a decade. I just think that that might be his biggest strength, just being so keenly aware of what these kids are going through and how hard it is and helping them through that. I, I, I'm excited to watch his relationships grow. Coach, can you speak to that for a moment? Uh, I, I think it's absolutely correct. The, it is about um, the psychology of coaching almost is more important than the X's and O's. And I don't want to take away what we do X and O's wise, um, but it's obvious and it is sad and disappointing that the previous staff did not get to that level because it doesn't take an IU guy to do that. It takes a good coach to do that because they're young kids in, in a new situation with a lot of pressure. Um, you should try to connect with your kids uh, in, in every level of, of, of basketball. So it, that it being a strength, that will be fantastic because that helps the head coach be able to do something else. I also think he's been in the Big Ten and learned from the, one of the best coaches around in the Big Ten of how to compete in the Big Ten. That'll help Woody, too. Uh, understand when he's going to play Ohio State, what what have they done for the last 10 years? Because he's got it all, you know, if he's very thoughtful, he knows that X's and O's piece too. But boy, what a double bonus there is if he really, if that is really what he is being brought on to do as well as coaching X's and O's. And that's, that's, a, that's a, a home run situation. Ward, do you have any advice for what Dane should do with those god-awful lime green ties that he's always wearing on the sidelines? Because he no longer needs them. Do, do we auction I, them? Do we burn them? Like, what, what do we do I with them? you send them to Eric <laughs> so he can put them out in the yard and create a bonfire and tweet it out the <laughs> night that Dane gets to Bloomington. Ooh. I, 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 okay. I want to piggyback on, real quick, on your fifth uh, point in your argument, your devil's advocate argument for Mike Woodson, which yes. I think was a great one of unfinished business. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk about right. Dane, you He's know, got unfinished he, business too. He, he got us right there. We got right to the mountaintop and just fell short of planting the flag. And, and I love that as sort of an in, intangible um, uh, motivator for not only the coaching staff, but them, to also be able to, like Dane can say, as a guy who's from a different generation of Woody, you know, to be able to say, guys, I know what it takes at least to the, get to the final four. And at here's Indiana. how I learn yeah. what's that? At Indiana. He's the only guy that's, that we've that, had. You that's know, what I'm saying. Time. Like, yeah. for, for somebody on staff for, to, who's even younger and got further in the tournament than Woody, to be able to bring in that mentality of, you know, this is not something just your your grandparents experienced. I was right there. I came so close to hit, hit like hanging that sixth. Come to Bloomington, or now that you're here, learn from me why that team, what our mentality was. Because you're always going to have different players with different skill sets, and it's going to be up to, to Woody primarily to figure out how to make that mesh on the court. But the mentality to get that far and be that great is something you can't have too much of on your bench. Oh, absolutely. He also uh, was six years as a head coach in a division one program and, and starting yeah. a program that was somewhat from scratch, uh, trying to build that up at, at IPFW. So that's a, that's an additional bonus there that, that he's been the one calling the shots too. Um, so that, that last 16 years has been really, that that's kind of hard to hire into uh, an assistance position. Can, can I can I counter some of what I heard from Coach as we were waiting to come on? Would you mind? <laughs> of Karen? course. No, this is, a, this is a place for open expression of opinion and debate. That's what we do here. So I heard Coach saying, you know, none of it matters. We got to play. You know, it, it's all great. We can throw a party. But, you know, we had home run hires before. Okay. But, Coach, it's April 5th. We're not going to play a game 
till November. So just live in this right now. We <laughs> haven't had anything great to cheer about. So let's just all cheer like hell right now. You're right. We're going to have to win. There'll be plenty of time to rip apart the performance later. But for now, it should be all cupcakes and sandwiches. It should be all rainbows and unicorns. I got the hat on. Ward's got his warm up on. It's like that. We're fans. We're fanatics. We are dying for something positive. Let's just focus 100% on that and not worry about any of that stuff because guess what? We can't control any of it. So that is, that is very true, but that's why you're a fan and I'm a fan and a coach All right, uh, because, because the coach, as soon as the season ends, we're planning for the next one. And, and uh, yeah, I get that. It, this is nothing but positive news. Um, but, you know, to think that we're final four bound because UCLA went in, in year two with Mick Cronin, we got a long way to go. That And and I'm just going to be that coach. You know, you got a long way to go. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's positive. I, I just, I just want to know you, why. why I'll did let it take you smoke Mick, your cigars. Why did it take Mick Cronin two years? Let's do it in year one, baby. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, but, but speaking oh, of that. Mick Cronin, Mick Cronin made a good hire for an assistant coach. <laughs> well, okay, so spe- speaking of that, I mean, I know obviously you guys have had Michael Lewis on your podcast. What sense do you get about – the possibility of him rounding out the staff. And do you think that would be a good fit? Oh, yeah, I think it would be a good fit. Okay, well, I just want to tee up an easy one for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I can't speak to what's going to happen. Um, Michael loves Indiana. He's loved it. The first time Ward and I got to talk to him on the podcast, he talked about loving Indiana. We got to meet him after that. He talks about loving Indiana. I think that if it all worked out, that it would be great for Michael to be back. And – the dude is a great coach. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's – look, anytime you have Brad Stevens, Chris Holtman, even the guy that he coached with at Eastern Illinois who went on to be the head coach of the Knicks, you know, in the NBA, and then Mick Cronin who all rave about you, you're doing something right. You're doing something really right. And don't forget Porter Moser hired him – but let him get out of that deal two weeks later because Brad wanted him back in Butler. True. And Tim Miles did the best that Nebraska's done. So it, it's really been a success everywhere Michael's gone. And getting to talk to Michael a little bit and even knowing through this tournament run, like what, what games were his scout, you, you realize he has a very, very real impact on what that team does on the court for these different coaches, particularly in this tournament run where it's just like, damn, this guy can coach. And then if you were to throw him in with Woody and with Dane, and you have this, like this, this dream team of IU coaches where it's like, you have the most accomplished coach that was a former IU player in Mike Woods, nine years in the NBA as a head coach, over 20 altogether, plus the playing experience. And you have the two best assistant coaches in the country who used to play for IU. That's the dream team. Who yeah. doesn't want that? It's it's I, I, like it's not just like, oh, they're Indiana guys, so we're doing them a favor. Like, no, these are the most qualified guys to do this. You know, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I think the entire fan base would crawl through glass to get Michael Lewis here because we just hold him in such high regard. And, I mean – I mean, if that's your staff, Thad Mata, Michael Lewis, Dane Five, Kenya Hunter, it, I mean, it, it's, it's a dream team. The question, I think, is, you know, a lot of coaches, they want at least one coach they've worked with before. You know, like, is Mike Woodson, does he have somebody in mind? Does he have someone that he's worked with? And I, and I don't know, you know, but, you know, could that, because there's only one spot left. So that's what's going to be interesting to watch. I would think that we'll get closure or get some clarity on it within the next couple of days, you would think. Um but that's you know that's all that's left to watch. But as it is right now, it's a great staff, and now they're just figuring out kind of what the cherry on top is going to be. It feels like. Yeah, I I think that's fair. I think that we all do have to remember it's still Mike Woodson's team, so Mike has to you know have guys that he trusts and he feels really good about. And you know, as fans, we would love it to be Michael Lewis because we love him, and also because we think he's great. And also, I mean, I hate to bring this up, but. Tom Allen comes on our podcast before the year, historic season. <laughs> Terry Morin comes on our show before the year, historic season, and then gets a big raise. Tom Allen comes on after the season, onto our podcast, gets a million-dollar raise. Michael Lewis comes on our show, 
before the NCAA tournament, before the Michigan State game, Dane Fife blew us off. Michael Lewis comes on. One of those teams went to the Final Four, and the other went home. So then, so why the hell are we having you on our show? Why don't you have us on your show so some good stuff happens to us? Well, Jared, we didn't get, we were on their show. We didn't get anything. That's true. Yeah, you're lying. All four exactly of us were on. That's if right. anything, it hurt your credibility. Look, some might argue Archie Miller came on your show too. That is true. We're just not going to focus on it. Yeah. Okay, so that's the coach part of it. And this would be a huge day if that were the only news that we got today. It would be worthy of its own emergency podcast. But ladies and gentlemen, the five-star point guard who reclassified to come to Indiana last season is sticking with the Hoosiers, as is Jordan Geronimo, who was not as ballyhooed of a recruit. But I know I was not alone in seeing some flashes from him last year that make me think he's going to be a really good player as an upperclassman. Coach, let's talk first about Christian Lander. You know, look, maybe a little shine came off of him because of how he played last year. But, you know, for those of you who listened to the conversation that I had with Sam Vicini that we that we um, that we put at the end of the last podcast, you know, he was I thought he made a great point about Christian, which is, look, these guys that classify. (laughs) Basically, he said, look, if you something along the lines of if you have a son, a point guard who's thinking about reclassifying up, don't let him do it because it never goes well for the guys that do it. So don't let him do it. Uh, but he basically said he's, you know, he's not thinking any less of him based on what he saw from the first season because a lot of these guys struggle. So as you start to project forward with Christian based on what you saw last year and based on kind of the little bits that we know of how Mike Woodson wants to play, you know, I don't need to ask you how important it is because we know how important it is. But what do you kind of project for Christian now as he moves into what should have been his freshman season? Well, I think he gives us a legitimate top level point guard at his best. Um, that he has some moxie to him where, you know, he's not afraid to take a shot. Uh, obviously he needs to have a, a better, uh, shot than what he showed, but there, there was a lot that probably went into that last year, trying to learn the college game. Uh, obviously the, the, the way this, the program was, was going, um, and not getting a lot of run, all of that could add into to that, but he's got that pace. I'm a really, I'm hoping that coach Woodson plays with a remarkable pace, Christian Lander gives us that opportunity to pitch the ball ahead, to do some of those things. Uh, and he just has vision. Uh, some of the passes he made last year, I, I just I just saw the potential for uh, stuff we see in the tournament with guys making passes to backdoor cuts and the wraparound passes into the post. If Coach Woodson can really uh, develop that and, and bring that out in a year, two years, whatever Christian has, we're going to see a special player because he played with the USA Olympic trial stuff. And, and you saw – you know, pitch aheads. The, the young man is a, was a five star for a reason, uh, and, and now Coach Woodson and staff are bringing that out. I project that he'll have a pretty good year. How good? Um, you know, obviously, again, it goes back to that potential word that Eric's going to get mad at me for talking about. But um, no, I, I'm excited. That was that to me. I mean, I like Race and I like Armand and I like those guys and I want all of those guys back. But but Christian Lander at that five star point guard was probably. The reason um, what was the number one thing for me to watch. Yeah, and look, he's got skills he's got to develop. His shot needs to improve. He's got a lot of things. But, man, he's got some of that stuff that you just can't teach. And if we actually become a program that develops right. players again, he's got as much raw material to develop as anybody. Uh, and speaking of having as much raw material as anybody, Ryan Phillips has joined us. Uh, bespectacled Ryan Phillips has joined us. No yeah, beard. Was McC- now you got glasses. Look at this. I know. thought it was McFly. <laughs> I'm getting my eyes zapped a week from Wednesday, so no contacts for two weeks. It's been quite an adventure. You know, I, I don't thought, know how, I thought, I coach, maybe, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. This is driving me nuts. So I, I just thought maybe you were rethinking how poorly you had analyzed Mike Woodson's NBA coaching career that you put some glasses on to see it a little clearer. <laughs> no, it's I lost the beard and Eric got mad at me. So I thought if I added another accessory, he might get uh, get excited about it again. <laughs> but I do like the accessories. I'm, I'm thanks, I'm, buddy. I'm okay. into it. All right. Looks smart. Okay, I, got- I know it's the first time in a while. It's all right. So your thought? How do, can you be on for a little while, or do you have to bounce? Oh, uh, I got about fifteen happening? minutes. Sure. Okay. So give me your. We we just talked about Dane Fife. So give me your thoughts on Dane Fife, and then and then talk about Christian. Look, I think it's a great a great hire. I think that obviously I, I was listening to you guys, and and I agree with everything that was said. His connections to IU, his connections to the Midwest, his connections to the Big Ten. Uh, the guy's recruited at a really high level, and and has been you know 
right hand man to uh, a Hall of Fame coach for a decade now, and, and so I think that it's it's a great hire for Indiana. I think that it works for both parties. I think Dane was maybe you know looking for another for something else, and I think that Indiana certainly could use a guy of his caliber. And, and I think that obviously the connections to the program. I mean, there's, there's a huge segment of the fan base who's wanted Dane Fife to be part of Indiana's program for. A long time and looked and watched him every time he was on the bench for Michigan State and thought, wow, why can't we have that? You know, and and uh, I look, I, I think it's a great hire. And, and I'll say that uh, pretty much everything Mike Woodson's done since he arrived, I have been an enormous fan of. And when I say pretty much, I mean everything, you know, it's it, it. Let's be real. It's everything that's that's happened since the day he got hired has been a positive from from Thad Mata to retaining Kenya Hunter to getting, convincing Trace Jackson Davis to come back, something people did not think was possible. Uh, and, and then, you know, starting to retain some of the players. And look, if you bring back the players that were on this year's roster and, you know, get a transfer or two, and you are as good a coach as people think you are, that's a good team. Like the talent wasn't the problem. The, the development was the problem. I think the way that pe- players were utilized was the problem. And maybe just the systems that were being run with that personnel were the problem. And I don't think it's a lack of pure talent. I think some guys maybe aren't as, tal- aren't as good as we thought they were. Some are better than we thought they were. But I think in the end, that all balances out. I think with that roster, you can be a pretty good team next year. You're not going to win a national title, but you can be a pretty good team and then build from there. You know, you're going to... And so I think that it's a group that's not bad. And I think that that maybe got thrown around because they had a bad season and they finished poorly. But I think that there's talent there to build with. And, and I think if you're Mike Woodson and you can retain the key guys, and it looks like so far he's on path to retaining the key guys. I don't know about Armand Franklin. Don't know about Ray Thompson. And I don't know what's going to happen in the transfer market. Has but anyone you can, checked Twitter since we started the show? Yeah, the seriously, with the so way fast. it's all dropping today. <laughs> but but I think that, you know, you put a good staff, you put smart people around you and, you know, Thad Mata and, and Kenya and, and Dane Fife, and you it, build with what you've got. Then you go out and show what you've done. You know what the most important thing to recruits is? Quite frankly, it's it's the guys who want to go to the NBA, it's development, but to you know, the, the, the lion's share of recruits, you know what they want to go to a successful program. If you show them, you can build with success and be successful. More people are going to want to come play for you. And so that's the most important thing. And, and I think that his first year, while it's not make or break in any stretch of the imagination, being successful in your first year gives you a huge leg up on year two and then a huge leg up on year three and allows you to build those relationships with people who are more interested in your program because they say, Oh, he can actually get results. That's not me. Uh, <laughs> that was me. I didn't expect to be live today, guys. I didn't expect to be live. <laughs> so, no, I, I think that that being able to retain those guys and then bring in some some new blood to kind of you know mix it up a little bit is is a huge positive for him. And then again, put smart people around you. It's the success story of any CEO. The success story of anybody who's in a position of power. You're only as good as the people around you. And, and you make yourself better by putting smart people around you. And kudos to Mike Woodson for realizing that and, and wanting to do it. Can, can I respond real quick? Go yes. ahead. All right. So first, was thing, that not optimistic enough for you? It was good. <laughs> it was good. It was better than Ryan normally is. So I'm, I'm okay with it right now. But the whole, you're not going to win a national championship next year. We're in LA, Ryan, you're in San Diego. No one looked at that UCLA team. They lost their best player. They had a transfer from Kentucky who couldn't get clock in Kentucky. They had Cody Riley, who was like a mediocre, o- overs- undersized big man, and they went to the Final Four. So, yes, it was a magical run for them. I'm not saying I expect us to go to the Final Four, but who the hell knows? Of that course. It was so much fun. We have Trace Jackson Davis. We got Christian Lander back. It's like, who knows? But I do want to say one thing about Christian. I'm so happy that he's back. I mean, we, Same. I think all of us in various text chains, Ward and I, of course, we lived it together. But Jared, you and me, Jared, uh, you know, Ryan, you and I talked. Coach, you and I didn't talk personally about this, but we all wanted to see Christian just play more. We were like, just yeah. please, just get him in there. Yes. And so there's, there's on-the-court stuff that's really important for Christian because we think he has that next-level talent. But there's also this piece. He was a five-star from Evansville, and had he transferred – that would not have been a good look for Mike Woodson. No, 
that would have been a very bad look to start his Indiana recruiting trend and his recruiting reputation. And the fact that he kept him and Christian Lander had, by all accounts, an awful experience his freshman year, you know, regardless of whether he should or shouldn't have reclassified, he did. And it was a bad year. Mike Woodson was able to convince him, forget all that. It's a new start. This is where you should be. You think one day you're going to be in the NBA. I think I can help you get there. And doing it right here at the place you had that bad experience is the best place for you. That speaks volumes to the other five-star high-level talent in the state. They take note of that. And I think that that is as big of a positive of retaining Christian as what he'll do on the court. And I think he'll be great on the court. Yeah, Eric, what what I mean by you're not going to win a national championship, I mean, nobody expects that from you. Like, if right. you don't win a right. national championship in your first year, nobody's going to be like, well, damn it, what are you doing? You know, right. but I'm right. saying, like, no, that's not the expectation. The expectation is make this team better right away, you yeah. know? And and somebody said to me on on Twitter, like, well, Woodson will definitely be better than Archie. And I said, yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. He'll be better than Archie. That's not our expectation, but, hey, be better than that in year one. You know, our expectation is to compete for Big Ten championships, be relevant nationally and occasionally be in position to make that deep run. And and once you make a deep run, as UCLA proved, anything can happen when you're making a deep run. And there's so much luck involved in the tournament. Nobody ever knows who's going to win it. Yeah, we got the top two teams in the final game this year, but there were points along the way where that definitely couldn't have happened. I mean, UCLA's hitting mid-range jumpers contested throughout an entire game shots that you would tell your play you would you would remove players from the game if they were shooting those normally and they're knocking them down repeatedly in that game the other night very easily could have gone either way and somebody said to me well that just shows you know Gonzaga may not be as good as we thought I was like no it shows you that anything can happen in the NCAA tournament that is right. why it's such a crapshoot the best team often doesn't win the NCAA tournament I mean the best team all year often doesn't win because it's such a crap. Yeah, that that so, would have been the wrong lesson to take from that game. I took the lesson that Gonzaga is amazing. Yeah. UCLA was just, the fact they that played UCLA played so well, played so well in a big spot. So much. And Gonzaga still won. It is, is what, what tells me. And Gonzaga played arguably, if you look at them this year, arguably their worst game of the season and still won it and scored almost a hundred points. I mean, it's, yeah. But can, anyway, can we, back to Indiana. Obviously, mm-hmm. Ward wants to say something. The, the power of positivity here, and this goes back to what Coach was saying too. And we, as fans, which Eric and I are, we 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 don't claim to be experts, and anybody who's listened to us knows that's the case. We're not <laughs> experts, but it's it's to prove Jay Billis wrong, right? Like we all know how he came after us, and it's like, what is in our power right now? What what we've been getting blamed for? is the negativity and the toxicity. And Woody has the new coach smell, right? He's got, and and with that, all we can do is feed into the narrative that we are super hyped about this. And in theory, when we're doing that in a negative way, it hurts our recruiting. And it even negatively affects the players on the team because they can't keep themselves cocooned from that. So in the same way, the fan base really got on board quite quickly with Woody because I think they educated themselves very quickly as to what an impressive dude he is. And now he's done all these great things, getting this staff together, getting these players to stay, that if we are all putting out there as best we can through social media, podcasts, texting with friends like, hey, trains leave in the station, choo-choo, let's go. That is doing our part. And I think, yeah, to Coach's point, we're going to have to see it out on the court. But the more we're all on board from the jump, I think even now and and before the team takes the court, we could be looking at some 2022 guys. They're already talking to 23 guys who can look over, check the hashtags and be like, oh, people are excited. I want to be a part of something positive. So that's it. We can do this together. I like everything about that. Coach, Coach. <laughs> Let's go. Coach Woodson's on board uh, with that word. <laughs> on Christian Lander, since you guys sort of addressed him when, when I came on, I agree that next level vision is there with him. And I completely agree with Eric that you got to retain your five star from a section of the state, you know, from a segment of the state. You got you to gotta keep him because guess what? There's going to be other kids from that region that you need to get down the road. And if Christian Lander had a bad experience, you know, that does write people off and, and, and have them consider other coaches say, Hey, well, you know, this coach over here didn't never screwed over one of my players and this program 
didn't call my player bad and say he was overmatched and all that stuff. So I think it's huge that they retain him. I also think it, for, for the psychological reasons, but I also think it's it's enormous for the on-court reasons. That next level vision he has, the ability to push the basketball, which Mike Woodson seems to want to do. Uh, the only thing that he needs to work on, quite frankly, is getting bigger. And I think we all can agree with that, that physically he was outmatched this year, as you would expect, being a guy who reclassified. But he's also got to work on his jump shot. I mean, that is he that should be all, everything he's focusing on should be getting in the gym and getting bigger and fixing the jump shot. And it's the feet with the jump shot. We talked about that when he was recruited and when he committed coach and I went on at length about the fact that, you know, his feet are headed into the stands while his body is headed towards the hoop. And that that doesn't work out. It, it lowers the margin of error on your shot considerably. You have to have a strong base under you to make a jump shot. And, and so um, obviously he's been able to get away with it at lower levels because he's had all the time in the world to get his shot off. You know, he's so talented that even against top AAU guys, he'd be able to step back and have plenty of room and plenty of time to gather himself, get enough of a base and shoot, but that's not going to work in the big 10. And so he's really got to start doing, you know, shifting his shot over and look, there are guys who've had similar problems with their jump shot, whether it's the feet or whether it's the way they move the ball in their hands before their jump shot, all of that. The number one way to fix a jump shot is to get stronger. You've seen it with the Ball brothers. LaMelo and Lonzo Ball are now good three-point shooters, and they were not for a very long time. What did they do? They got in the gym and got stronger, and then they started working on getting their bodies together as one part of a whole shot and not having an all-upper body shot or an all-jump shot. So it's got to just be paired as a smooth jumper and he's got to get stronger because he doesn't need to launch the ball the way he did uh, in his freshman year or in high school if he's strong enough to do it. So I think he can do it. I don't think it's not broken. I think the release and the rotation are fine. But the problem is if you don't have a base under you, you're all you're you're using way too much arm in your shot. So. And that, 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 my no, time's up. That, that's my time is up. Arm for no more questions. Twitter to see if someone else has a music lesson. I right? mean, just just to recap what's happened on this call with Ward. His lighting rig <laughs> fell in the middle of Ryan talking. That thing collapsed. His alarm has gone off twice. He hasn't figured out to hit the mute button yet. When he, <laughs> he, he, I, I mean, it's he, okay. He set that to make sure that he checks Twitter for more good news every ten minutes. Like, oh, I just need to check. So it's oh, okay. Yeah, we've hired Michael Lewis. Yeah. There, <laughs> here, here's something though. We we also. Also need to be careful, and, and, and Eric's going to come after me on this too. But we also need to be careful that if the two remaining guys in the portal decide to leave, that's not a negative necessarily a negative for Coach Wood. You know, Woodson. You know, he might try really hard, and they just have better offers or want to go home. So, yes, I do yeah. agree that keeping the Indiana guys, Trace Jackson Davis, was probably the number one. When you kept him, that's going to tell a lot of people that your message is really good. This was the second one that really kind of hammered home that the message is coming in. But if if Armand and Race leave, that doesn't mean that his message all of a sudden got bad. Right. You know, there's so totally there's agree. so much that goes on in yeah. what what offense he wants to run. Does he see a certain player play in this position? Does he have someone else in the portal that he believes might come in and challenge? And then therefore these two guys say, you know, I don't want to fight for a position. I, I want to go somewhere else. You know, there's a lot of things that go into it. So yes, I think it speaks volumes for what coach Woodson is doing, but we also got to get ready. If we, we're not going to have an emergency podcast, if one of those guys leave, right. It's not agree. coach Woodson's he's shown enough right now that if those two leave, uh, we know they got that their he's, own reasons, he's a good whatever recruiting. they are. Yes, if, absolutely. Look, good Ray, for them. Grace Thompson. I mean, if he wants to go home and spend the last few years at home with a new coach in Minnesota, it makes sense. Where but his I, dad played, you know, went look, and played sports. Like, yes. That's understandable. And look, I think with Armand Franklin, we all want him back because we see the star potential. But if you're Armand and Illinois is telling you you can step right in and play the I.O. role, you know, or I know Virginia's talking to him and Michigan's talking to him, you know, he's got some incredible options that even in comparison to all the good stuff happening in Bloomington, there's still some unknowns about how a Mike Woodson team will actually play. You know, and so if the other option is you can go step in for IO into this role at Illinois, it's going to be hard. Now, you know, if he does come back, you'll I mean, he will have turned down some great options. So, you know, we wait to see. And and if he does, you know, there will be other guys, you know, that Indiana can obviously go after in the transfer portal. But uh, look, we, we want let's all also those remember guys back. Let's also remember these guys are going to school and their kids 
and they could have a thousand reasons why they're going to leave. You know, it could be that they don't like seeing their ex-girlfriend on campus every day. I mean, whatever it is, like there's considerations outside of basketball for all of this stuff as well. I'm not saying that applies to either one of the guys remaining in the transfer portal. I don't, I don't, I don't, have, I don't have insider information. Yeah, <laughs> well, I never left. They could have gotten food poisoning somewhere. They just don't want to walk by anymore. You know, I mean, the, the, but there's a, there's a million reasons why these guys make these decisions. Uh, sometimes it's a business decision as far as the, the next level. Sometimes it's playing time. Sometimes it's whatever, being closer to family. Uh, you have to let them make their decisions, just like coaches can make their own decisions and assistant coaches can make their own decisions. These kids have to be able to make their own decisions. That's the rules right now. If we don't like them, we gotta we gotta change the rules, but that's what it is. And and so uh, I don't I don't think it's fair to get on kids if they make certain decisions. And I'm glad the kids who no. just who have decided to return. All right, let's I talk agree. about. Oh, finish up, Eric. Finish I was going to say there are a million reasons, but one of them is not school. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, let's be real. It, there's I a mean, million. There's a million, or maybe now there's nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. School <laughs> and classes ain't one of them. <laughs> Not for Armand. Armand can do whatever he wants, right? I'm yeah. saying already Woody's at a real disadvantage because Armand didn't get the full benefits of college life in Bloomington. It's true. That's true. That we, we know that's going to return to the fold this fall. So whether Armand does get to enjoy everything going to IU has to offer or not, you know, I just wish well, he, you know, compared to Illinois, uh, yeah. I've been there. It's not, yeah. No, no I, I, I will say this too. I will say this too. And it's, and it's kudos to, to Woodson and the staff and, and for retaining the guys they have, because for two weeks, those guys were only hearing from other school, probably mostly hearing from other schools and yep. hearing about how wonderful it is and how perfect it is. And in their head, they're thinking, Oh yeah, I could go somewhere else. I don't know who the coach is going to be and get sort of got lured and they had to be pulled back. It wasn't, it wasn't yep. like, you know, they were starting even with these other schools. They're behind. And so kudos for, for bringing the guys and, back that they have. And if I can make one more point, I think Ward and I are going to talk about this more in our podcast that we, we taped tonight for tomorrow. But the thing, to go back to what Coach was talking about a little bit, um, about Coach Woody's message, and, and if these guys don't come back, that doesn't mean the message was was bad. I totally agree. What impresses me the most, and I've been saying this with Ward behind the scenes for a while, is – Look, all these guys can coach basketball. Like Archie Miller can coach basketball. He knows basketball. He knows more about basketball than all of us who are critiquing him. He does. He didn't become a bad coach coming to Indiana. It didn't work for a variety of reasons, but he's a good basketball coach. Thank there you. is that special sauce. And I like to think of it as there is like basketball intelligence and, you know, that's schematics and scouting and X's and O's. And then there's, emotional intelligence yep. and what do your players need to hear what buttons do you have to press how do you have to psych psychologically like you talked about coach manage them to get the most out of them and what I heard from that trace press conference it still sticks in my head when someone asked him what was the one thing coach Woody said to you that made you realize you wanted to come back and his answer was he told me all the things I didn't want to hear that was key for me that is everything to me. To me, that shows an emotional intelligence from Woody where he got a quick read of this kid and realized, and part of this is just probably Woody's personality. I'm not going to blow smoke up his butt. I'm not going to lie to him and tell him how great he is. I'm not going to do all that. I'm going to tell him what's wrong. And that takes an emotional intelligence to be able, when you are trying to pull a kid back who said he was dead set on going to the pros, to pull him back by telling him what he's doing wrong, that shows a intelligence emotionally that I think is the most impressive thing I've heard so far about Coach Woody. He's real. He tells you what you don't want to hear. And that clearly has connected with a number of these kids so far. I would bet you the same is true for Christian Lander without knowing what Christian Lander has said about it. But that emotional intelligence is what is most impressive to me about Woody. And you hear it from his NBA players. You can go on YouTube and see Kenyon Martin and Raymond Felton and Carmelo Anthony talk about that. That to me is the most impressive thing with coach Woody so far. Yeah. You the one absolutely, off on me. <laughs> you're absolutely correct. But I think that emotional intelligence is what makes good coaches, good coaches. Mm -hmm. and, and I, so I'm agreeing it with separates you, them. but I will also tell you there, especially at my level, there are some dudes that can't coach. So, and I'm, I'm pro coach. <laughs> like I, I won't ever bad mouth the coach out loud. 
but I've coached against some guys that I really enjoy coaching against. But no, uh, but I think no wise. But yeah, you're right. It's that special sauce that that really makes it. And his NBA experience, uh, that's where it might really play pay off because those guys are getting millions of dollars and don't have to listen. And you've got to find ways to get the defense, the move, the practice, uh, the strategy, all of that into these pro players that have millions of dollars and all of their friends hanging out and all of that stuff. So it really takes uh, that. And if he brings that down to the college level, man, that is a, that's going to be fantastic. I think you're spot on 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 that. So I can we can agree with you on that one. Coach one thinks I'm right. Coach thinks I'm right on everything. I want. I need to be on your show tonight so I get a pay raise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go out on top. I like that. Coach agrees. Ryan and I are in a good place. Jared and I are always simpatico. It's a this good day. Is good. Ward, Ward's not mad at me. He's still screwing up with the lights and the and the <laughs> alarm. I feel like I've really won this segment. So I'm taking off on top. <laughs> Get out of here. Thanks for being don't, here. Don't say anything. Just exit. No more questions. You, don't, don't jinx it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Take care. Peace. I feel weird being here without eric i mean <laughs> we know yeah do you have, no, do you have I, a, car, do you have a cardboard cut out of him that we can you know that we can make fun I of don't or? but, no. oh, but we right. could just shit on him right <laughs> yeah now. i mean that's cool. i'll take shots at him. uh one thing i want to say that eric is right is that what <laughs> about you know all these guys know how to coach and the other thing i want to say is people are talking about woodson's you know what's his system going to be is it going to be sort of a hybrid of different systems you know we don't really know it's just he's going to he didn't get into details because he could probably talk about it for three hours at his introductory press conference what i'll say is any system works if it's run right and and quite frankly archie system probably works if it's run right and more guys hit threes we'll probably still have archie miller as our head coach if there's actual buy-in which is going to help yeah well that that as well i mean you need that from you need that in any system but so system i mean while it matters to be sort of modernized and and sort of be competing with other people as being able to hit threes and and do the things, you know, you need to do at this level to win pretty much every system does that to some degree. It's about how you run it and running it right. And having everybody on the same page and having people know where they need to be and having people confident enough to make decisions in their own offense. I mean, we saw it a lot last year point guard comes across half court and would immediately look to Archie for what are we running and what do I need to do here? No, a point guard needs to know when he comes across half court and has to have the agency to be able to say, we're running this play right now because I see the defense is set up this way. We can get a mismatch with this guy on this guy, and it's going to work that way. And if we don't get that, there's going to be two other options. So let's run this and and make that decision as opposed to needing to look over to the coach every time. I hate it in college football when the quarterback gets under center and they get ready to snap the ball and he steps out and everybody looks at the sideline and has to be told what to do. And quite frankly, the great quarterbacks don't have to do that. They recognize the problems, and that's because they're coached well. And so I I would say that I think that system needs to be something that everybody's bought into, as you said, Jared, and just needs to be so everybody's on the same page running the right thing at the same time. That's all you need. It doesn't matter what the system is. All right, we have to talk about Jordan Geronimo and give him give him some time because he is a very important piece to be coming back. He's an especially important piece to be coming back given the way that Indiana wants to play because this is a guy who's six 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 seven, athletic. He showed this year that he can go down in the post and guard people. He's got the athletic ability to be able to switch out on the perimeter too. Now he's raw, and we saw that rawness. You know, he was a guy early in the season that didn't look like he knew where to be half the time which is understandable given that he was a freshman and didn't have a lot of those early games where those guys usually get their feet wet. But you saw in Indiana's wins against Iowa how important he was. And he really had some big moments, you know, kind of late in the season as a spark plug and an energy guy. And coach, you know, where I'm really interested in Geronimo is his ability as a potential stretch four type, which, you know, look, if you look at his three-point shooting as a freshman, 40%. However, it was only on 10 attempts. And if you look at his free throw shooting, he was 5 of 18, 27.8%, which suggests a guy that does not have shooting all figured out. So we should by no means say that this guy, you know, is ready to be that stretch four type player. But one thing that's really interesting to me is you look at his, the the Ken Palm player comps. And one of the player comps on there is Kyle Young from Ohio State. And Kyle Young from Ohio State has been one of the best glue guys in the Big Ten over the last couple of years. He's not a guy whose stats have been real flashy and all that stuff, but every single time you watch Ohio State play, and especially against Indiana, he's a guy making winning plays. 
that's the kind of guy that I think Jordan Geronimo can be. And he's actually, he's obviously got a bigger ceiling than Kyle Young because of the athletic ability and some of the other things that we've seen him do. So, you know, I don't know how ready Jordan Geronimo is to be a central piece next year, but I continue to be really high on his athletic ability, his effort, his attitude. And if the skills can catch up to that, I still really like what he can be as an upperclassman. And I think him coming back, you know, eschewing going home to stay in Bloomington because he believes so much in what's going on is a sign, I think, of, you know, th- clearly there were there were culture issues with the Indiana program in terms of buying and some things under Archie Miller, but there was great chemistry among the guys themselves, great friendships, great togetherness, which I think helped to get to get them through. And I think that's what the Jordan Geronimo thing coming back shows, that relationship he's got with Leal and Galloway and also buying into Mike Woodson. So I'm, you know, it's easy to kind of give – you know, kind of look at his news as the, the you know, the, the, you know, rank is like the third most important news today. But I think long term, it's so important that he decided to come back. So, coach, speak about what you see in Jordan's future as a player. Well, he's, he's, he could be a freshman again, right? Cause he gets that year over again yeah. if he ever wanted to down the road. Same with uh, Leo and Galloway. And those guys are all those wing size, you know, guys that like to win. And Geronimo is obviously more athletic than, than anyone else, but he brings an athlete. He brings someone who can play multiple positions, and he looks like a guy who wants to compete, and you want that. And if he, he's going to stay for at least three years because he's not an early entrant type of player, that Woody can mold to his uh, style of play and, and, and build and develop. And, and if, if Woody can do all – or Woody, Woodson, I should call him formally Coach Woodson, he gets that done in year three or four, you're talking about a Kyle Young type player. And you have – you know, the other uh, young men too, it's that get old, stay old mentality that we were hoping with the last regime, you need those guys. And that's a big get too. It's obviously Trace Jackson Davis and Lander, uh, obviously the biggest, but you have to have that foundation underneath too, in case of an injury, uh, practicing, uh, and then use their specific skills in certain games that they're needed uh, while they're developing uh, their game. And, and you never know, a sophomore could get more minutes and then junior and senior just be ready to go. And Coach Woodson's been through that at multiple levels. Uh, and I think that that shows that he's communicating. You stick with me. Here's where I can see you in year two, year three, year four. And if Woodson's doing that, man, he's really doing a good job. And I think it shows in those kids staying. And yeah. I th- just oh, go ahead, Ward. Super, super optimist. I mean, when you look at the athleticism, and when you frankly look at, at what Jordan looked like when he put up the few three pointers he did, OG Ananobi didn't show much as a freshman. We all knew he was a freak. Right? Well, toward the end of the season, he did. He came yeah, along at the end. He started to flash. And that that is the most optimistic outlook. But when you are, I think that idea of get old is is something we kept hoping to see. And we thought maybe it would be this year, but then we turned around and we're like the second youngest team in the big 10. But I think we all looked at this year's freshman class with Lander in there unexpectedly and being like, well, those guys could be the foundation. And you have to assume bringing trace back, getting Lander to stay, what he's going to be able to talk to the five stars in the state and get him to stay the NBA experience, I think, is going to give him an advantage to bring in those five stars out of state. We'd all like him to be around a couple years at least. We don't really want to be one and dones, but if you want to be more realistic, to, to Ryan's point, and not expect a national championship next year like I do, <laughs> uh, is that, yeah, we could very well be looking at these younger guys, the freshmen and sophomores who are deciding to come back to be the core of the team that really does have a shot to get, you know, you know, we'd like Michael Lewis to come back and hang that sixth banner with us. I think that's why he didn't this go around, but I (laughs) I feel like we're going to see immediately what, what this team looks like, because it would have been a lot harder if a lot of these guys left and it's apples and oranges with Woody, but now Woody's literally going to have the same team to play with an extra year of an experience. So that's an advantage for him. And I will call him Woody just because Eric and Do I are it. so informal. That's, 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 Do that, it. If he tells us to, to, to say something else, we will. But I think it's going to be a really fun experiment to see the same chess pieces out there used in a totally different way next year. Yeah, I, I'll say this about Geronimo. I think if you look at his three-point shot and his free throw form, the form is fine. He's just overshooting it. And, and he's shooting long. If he knows almost all of his free throws hit the back of the iron. 
or were, were long in some way. Yeah. And I think that th- he's just overshooting it and putting too much arm into it. And it may be that he gained a lot of muscle and is over muscling his shot. And, and I think that that's, you know, a freshman thing. He's got to work that out. That but happened to Yogi as a freshman. He, but he doesn't have to rebuild his entire shot. He's not like Lander where he's got to build it from the feet up. He's got a pretty solid foundation of his shot. I think the same about Anthony Leal. I think Anthony Leal's shot, he has to tinker with a little uh, to get it off a little quicker. But other than that, the foundation is there. And, and so there and there are other guys in IU I think are the same way. It's a matter of, matter of making those minor tweaks that weren't getting made over the last few years. Uh, as for what I think he can be, I think that if he starts making threes, he can be that classic three and D guy at six, six who can guard two to five, you know, because of his athleticism. I mean, you won't want him guarding a a center in the, in the big 10, except for under an emergency, but he's a guy you can call in to do it and just be active enough to annoy the crap out of that guy. And if a guy makes a hook shot over him, you're fine, but it's, you know, it's the kind of thing where he can harass and especially the six, uh, eight, six, nine type centers that you'll find. Sure. Well, those guys he could definitely guard. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but I mean, if you, if you put him up against Garza, there's going to be some struggle, a guy like Garza. There's going to be some struggles, but it doesn't mean that he can't be active and and not annoy the guy and and you know be a pest. Um, but he's certainly so athletic. There's it's really a a really nice lump of clay that Mike Woodson and his staff get to mold into whatever they want. Do you want him to be a three point shooter? Do you want him to work on his ball handling and be more of a perimeter oriented guy? Do you want him to simply work on getting stronger and be more of a he's inside and then can step out? I mean, there's a lot of range you can go to here, and that's why I was really sad to see that he was entering the transfer portal and everybody was talking about how he, his family wanted him closer to home. And you know, obviously that's changed after talking to, to Mike Woodson and, and being around the staff and being around his players. And you made a great point. Somebody made a great point. Was it Jared? Did you say about the team being close? Who said yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This team was exceptionally close. Everything you heard was how tight they were. I think the problem was there was a disconnect between the leadership of the team, the coaching staff and the players, whatever that was. But this team was very, very close. And I think that's having a big impact. I think Trace coming back is having a big impact on everybody else because he was sort of a de facto leader without being a captain. I mean, I I think that this is going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. And Ward's right. He has a chance to, instead of it being, you know, almost like Tom Crane's first year where you have a few guys back and you have to build your team with transfers and maybe guys you weren't going to give scholarships to until late or guys who had scholarships and broke, uh, had commitments and broke them because their coaches got fired or whatever. And you're, you're doing last minute deals to, to get players. He's going to have a foundation to build from of guys we thought would have been the foundation for the last coaching staff. And so I think that that's really an interesting uh, place to start and something maybe we didn't think was going to happen two weeks ago. So it's, well, it's, it, it, it we well, go ahead. Well, and hopefully, you know, there were two scholarships open this year and yes. how left. So keeping uh, these guys is not at the exclusion of bringing, fresh of guys in. you know, yeah. Xavier, for example, I am curious what you gentlemen think about trace went out of his way and he didn't have to, to say he thought Rob, was going to do a lot better in a new system. And I was a Rob apologist for a long time, and I finally kind of threw up my hands this year. But even still, at the beginning of the games, you could see him be aggressive and make a couple things happen, be confident in his shot. Do any of you buy that that even Rob could see – what, uh, yeah, coach. coach got well, I got. I mean, well, coach yeah. coached against him in high school, so let's get coach's thoughts on it. Yeah, um, oh, Ryan. Ryan, do you need to bounce? Yeah, I need to bounce. I'll, I'll give Go one ahead. thing about Rob, okay. and then and then get out. What I was going to say about Rob is the talent isn't the problem with Rob. It's what's between his ears. And if a new coach can sort of settle the the voices talking to him during a game, and the inner monologue say, "Don't shoot this. Don't shoot this. No, shoot that one. No, don't shoot that. Do that. No. Oh, guard this guy, but help on this guy, and and then maybe you know, and just play basketball. I think Rob will be fine." And, and 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 there were times you saw him able to mute that voice and just go out and play basketball and not overthink it. You could see him sometimes catching a ball on a wing and just thinking, should I shoot this? All right, yeah, but maybe not. And then it's released. And you're like, you can't doubt yourself. You just can't, especially when you're not when you're that good. Um, last thing I'll say is I again I'll just wrap this up to say that I've loved every move that that I've seen Coach Woodson make so far. Kudos to him, kudos to the athletic department for backing him. And, and pushing for these things. Kudos to a guy like that Mata for I'm, who I'm sure is helping out and, and, and kudos to the players for giving a new vision, a chance 
And uh, welcome back, Dane Fife, and uh, welcome back to everybody else. And Ward, it's really good to see you in non-flat form, uh, <laughs> I will say. And uh, we love having you guys on. So uh, thanks for stopping by today. I got to oh, go, guys. Go. See you, Ryan. All right. See you, Ryan. Coach, you coached against Rob Finnessy in high yeah, school. Yeah. You know, I think it, it has to be better because Rob just didn't play well um, last year. So I, I think that... that you know, the sky's the, the limit with him. I think he's got a lot of talent and, and you got to think that hopefully uh, coach Woodson just brings it out of um, Rob, but um, I've been a pro uh, Rob Finnessy guy from the time I coached against him a senior year. And he just lit us up <laughs> to, uh, to the time that he, as a freshman, I thought he was one of our better players in the program. So, you know, that um, I think that it has to be better. The question is, there's going to be a competition between him and Lander for who, you know, do they split it 2020? Uh, what if they bring in a, another guard that can handle the ball and, and have some competition? So I, I don't think that uh, Coach Wood necessarily is, is afraid of that um, as well. But I, I think Rob Rob is a key because he can guard. Th- that, I think, is is one of the most important things is that he can he can guard at a big level and run the offense, and that's where Lander ha- has to catch up to him. So, um, you know, I, I, I hope I hope that's the case. And, and uh, again, I think he's a quality individual, someone that we can be proud of. Um, you know, so you want to see that guy d- do better. And it looks oh. like we've lost uh, <laughs> we've lost Jared. Um, so hopefully he'll pop back in here soon. Go ahead. Well, my yeah, my heart just broke for Rob when he was missing those free throws at the end of the Rutgers game. Yeah. And, you know, just getting to talk to some former players and understanding everything that's going on behind the scenes that we can't know as fans watching. But what we do see is that frustration and disappointment. And we all know how ugly the end of that Rutgers game was in the stands and on the floor. And there's a, there's a real shot for redemption here for all these guys to come back and to to leave a positive legacy um, that nobody has to, you know, Al, Al has gone on and, you know, I think he'll, he'll fit in great at Providence and, and hit a lot of three pointers for them. But even, even trace what he said in that press conference was unlike anything we've heard since he committed to IU, he was sort of unfiltered, unafraid to just really express like this truth of what is going on. And that's good and bad about the past and moving forward. And if even the way Coach Woodson sort of talking to him was relayed, and then the way now Trace talks to us is kind of unlocking these guys in a way. And when we heard Trace talking about so many set plays and being so tightly controlled on what they were supposed to do, I hope it's all all symptoms of Coach Woodson's mentality of like, let these guys be themselves whether they're out there talking to the press, whether they're talking with me, whether we're in practice or we're playing in the game, just go guys. Like we'll, 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 we'll coach you up in practice. We'll tell you what to do, but then just let it all go and play ball. Yeah. Here's, here's something too, that has really grown on me with the, the, the Woodson hire um, and moving me off of cautiously optimistic to, to more towards you guys um, in this is that, he mentioned it's his last go around it, it. He's coming full circle. So I'm not sure he's going to f- quite feel the pressure. He'll put the pressure on himself because he wants Indiana basketball to be successful. But I think the last two coaches were really good coaches, but they allowed the pressure to get inside them and they became something they weren't. Uh, mm-hmm. And they were different by the time they left. Uh, and I'm not going to say that's on the fans or on the, the pressure of hanging another banner, but but I, I think Coach Crean and Coach um, Miller both came in and, and were, were somewhat successful um, in, in ways, in different ways, not necessarily Miller on the court, but they let that pressure come to them and they didn't have that connection to the family. And, and so, you know, I have not been, you need to hire an IU guy, you need to hire, I think you need to hire a good coach. And I'm getting to the point now where I think we hired a good coach who is an IU guy, and that extra benefit of being an IU guy is bringing everyone together, bringing Dane Fife back, making a lot of people happy. It still needs to get get done, obviously, as I said, and I believe on, on the court um, because of a variety of things. But I really think this being his last go around for how, however long he wants to coach, that might alleviate some pressure, and he doesn't have to prove to anyone uh, 
anything. And he comes across that way, Ward, just a confident person in his abilities. Um, and, and, and maybe it's a hope for me because the last two guys, I think, lost that confidence in themselves that were leading our program, and it filtered down to the players uh, at the back ends of, of, of their tenures. Um, your, your thoughts on, on that? I think you're absolutely right. It's a great point. First of all, Coach Woodson survived Coach Knight. That's really got to give you a sense of, hey, I can make it through anything. And then when you're the head coach of the New York Knicks, you can handle the, the spotlight. You can handle the pressure. And, and we think very much of the pressure cooker that is Bloomington. Uh, but if there's anything that surpasses that or is at least comparable to that in terms of fanaticism, the knowledge base of the fans, and the pressure that is put on the head coach to produce winning teams, and also uh, a franchise that has uh, not been that successful for the last 20 years. So there's really a lot of parallels. But Woody is who he is. He's clearly very confident in who he is. Now, we heard that about Archie. I didn't get to know him personally. People behind the scenes said he's he's very comfortable in his own skin. But it did not come across that way publicly at all. He seemed very uncomfortable. Whereas Coach Woodson, you know, he's up there on the mic. And I I was saying this to my daughter. I was like, I I think his voice would be good for ASMR. He almost puts you into like a meditative state. Um, And it's very calming. And that that comes from within. You know, Ward, the thing that that really – was a big part of his press conference was when he told Dolson, you're interested in, in Mike Woodson, get on a plane or, or send a plane to come get me. Um, you know, that's the kind of attitude you have to have to coach at a high pressure situation at, at Indiana. You, you, you've got to believe in your abilities. You got to believe in your message. You're going to tell people like it is, and then you're going to let, let it go. And, and the thing is you've been in the NBA where you've been relieved of a, of a situation before. And, and there's always two types of coaches, Ward. Those that are fired and those that are going to be fired. I mean, it's going to happen, right? So you get in this business, you know that you're going to have a change of address at, at some point. It happens to the best of us. But boy, he has confidence, I think, is one of the things that I think has resonated. Why a Geronimo comes back, why a Lander comes back, why TJD doesn't even try to go get you know uh, into the draft and, and come back. And I think those those are real positives to where – you bring in a guy that, that had success at a mid-major, might not have. And, mm-hmm. and that's the thing that, uh, again, I'm moving away from costly optimistic to happy. And I, I'm just – I am putting on the brakes uh, because the last 20 years have been frustrating. Uh, and that's more of a personal issue than, than anything else because I have no control over it. But uh, this, this week has just been a, a fantastic week. Uh, he couldn't have dialed up uh, a much better uh, eight days as his start as the Hoosier coach. Welcome back, Jared. Hey, good to be here. Sorry, my internet went out. So, <laughs> uh, well, I sh- I should probably bounce. You know, now now that Coach and I had a little yeah. quality one on one time. Absolutely, That's it was great. great. Um, <laughs> but thank you for having me on, and I'm just so happy right now. And it's with the texts and the phone calls and the FaceTimes and the podcasts and doing this with you guys. It has been a really rough go for all of us together. And I'm so glad we've had each other for these difficult times. I think in a lot of ways it's brought us closer, like the team that that loses a bunch in the early seasons. <laughs> now we can all be stronger. And it'll the, the victories that are coming, they are coming, are They're going coming. to taste so much sweeter. And I, I look forward to celebrating them with you guys. Absolutely. Thanks, Ward. Thanks for joining us on short notice, Ward. Anytime, guys. Take care. Good, good to have you here. All right, Coach. Well, thanks for thanks for manning the controls there while I uh... I, I was <laughs> desperately looking for the <laughs> sign off button. And I'm not even logged in. I just John got the link. I'm going okay, Jared. I can take care of this, but it might just go on forever. Well, I hey, I'm, keep... I'm no, I'm glad to know that it keeps working, even if I'm not here. That's good. Yeah, I thought I'd keep it on and watch the game and do a game report tonight of the national championship. <laughs> be a nine hour show. Uh, all right, so you guys close it up. The only thing that I want to say. Is is this the only coaching search ever where three of the names that were discussed as potential candidates all ended up on the staff? Because people talked about Mike Woodson as a potential candidate. A lot of people wanted Thad Mata, obviously, as a coach. And a lot of people were talking about Dane Fife. He's a guy we talked about when Archie Miller was hired. And now three of those guys are on the staff. It's pretty good. Yeah, I, I think good. 
again, we, we've mentioned it a lot, but Scott Dolson needs to, to, to have credit, a lot of credit for, and, and even if it doesn't work out, I'm going to give him credit because yeah, you know how important it is. I, I, I know this in education and coaching and, and most people who are in, in any kind of business knows the vision is important. And when you have a solid vision, it drives every decision you make. And if you don't have that vision and you just shotgun decisions out, your organization is never going to be successful. And so the fact that he shared, he didn't share the vision necessarily. We kind of get an idea of what it was that helped clarify to a lot of us who just didn't want the IU guy just because of the IU guy. We didn't get an IU guy just because he's an IU guy. We got an IU guy because it fit the vision. Yep. And, and when you put that vision up against some really famous guys or somewhat famous guys because of their success, that might not have matched. And Scott Dolson's AD, and he wants that vision, and he's going to make decisions based on that. And he's got coaches in many sports that are fitting that vision. That makes me proud uh, as as an alum of Indiana of doing it that way. You mentioned the, all of the, the mental health stuff, the, the Bill of Rights stuff, the uh, NIL stuff. Indiana has really done well for their athletes. And I think ultimately – if everything goes the way we think, this is going to be a really good decision uh, by Scott Dolson, regardless of whether I'm pumping the brakes a little bit uh, about potential, you know, um, or, or not. I, I, it's just impressive, and it's been backed up now by a series of, of, of quality things happening. Man, no question about it. I mean, there's, you know, look, I, I understand the, you know, kind of feeling cautious. And, and I certainly think, you know, once we get closer to the season, it's like, okay, now the games are going to start and we'll actually see the results. But man, I mean, you know, from the day that, that Archie was fired and to where we are right now, there's really, there's not much more that you could ask for, you know, right. there really isn't, you know, and that's, you know, what Scott Dolson has done is really, I mean, he's, he's reinvigorated with, with everything that's happened, a fan base that was, despondent indifferent like pick your adjective enthusiasm is back through the roof you know and it, that's what this program needed it really hammers home jared how wrong the university was to go away from coach knight soon after he was let go um the decision to let him go or not we could debate all that but you know uh, his time may have run his course at, at indiana let's just say it happened but then the decision to stay away for so long um yeah. And not just an IU guy, but get someone in that would do the things that an IU guy would do. The, 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 the coaching staff stayed away from bringing everyone back together. And like I said, you could bring a guy in from Nevada who would do the right job and make and take advantage of the great history we had. And none of the coaches really did. Um, yeah. and, and that, 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 that has just been frustrating and it's been eye opening to me that. That this kind of vision should have been done in the mid two thousands when Samson was hired. After you give it to Davis, and then okay, here's the vision, and and you might have gotten a B line. You might have got us someone that really wouldn't we wouldn't have had twenty years uh, of of struggle. And and so that that really hammers home that that position. And you just hope that it's backed up, you know, um, yep. because we we so badly needed our our podcast, our our fans, our listeners. <laughs> you know, we just. We just we just badly need it, and to that to that it's good what's happened because so much yeah. um, enthusiasm, and, and I don't mean to, you know, pee in anyone's weedies or anything, but uh, I, I I am a coach, and I, I do see the re the realism is you know these guys said yes to another coach too, and it didn't turn out. Now they're saying yes to this guy, so it, it, it's still got to turn out for me to to end up being super good. But uh, no, I I heard the news. I was just, just happy, you know, yep. just, just, just happy, uh, regardless. Agree. All right. Well, Hey, thanks to, uh, Eric and Ward from Hoosier hysterics coach. Thanks to you and Ryan for jumping on short notice. Thanks to my wife and daughter for, uh, for indulging me running home and saying, Hey, I got to go record something and being totally cool with it. Uh, and Hey, most of all, thanks to Dane Fife for coming home. Thanks to Christian Lander and Jordan Geronimo Absolutely. for, for sticking with us. You know, now we we await Armand Franklin and Race Thompson. Uh, we'd love to have those guys back. Absolutely want to have those guys back. Uh, but I think the points made earlier were good ones. You know, them their decision is not a referendum on what Mike Woodson is building. Uh, and, you know, their decision deserves no scorn or criticism if they choose to go elsewhere because both those guys have amazing options. And now they're trying to figure out what's the best for them. And so I wish both of them luck as they try to decide that. 
But boy, it sure feels like something special has happened in Bloomington, and I hope they're a part of it because it could be really, really special if you keep both of those guys there because they are, are both proven, really good college basketball players, and we'd love to have them. All right. That's... Nope, it's the wrong song. Okay. <laughs> that is going to do it for us on this week's episode of The Assembly Call or today's emergency episode of The Assembly Call. We will be back Thursday night with a brand new edition of Assembly Call Radio talking about whatever other great news has happened, maybe the next assistant coach or the decisions from Armand Franklin or, or other guys from the transfer portal, which we didn't even talk about today. So much going on, but we thank you guys for being here. We thank you for continuing to support the show, uh, and we will talk to you on Thursday night. Until then. Take it from me, native Hoosier Mark Titus. Keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosiers. Thank you. Thanks for coming out.